I am very pleased to be able to add the Thompson 01 to my collection. This is a great package. Hi there everyone, welcome back to another video here with me, Jenny Kirk. I hope I find you well and I hope you're staying safe during these difficult times. So I thought that I'd bring you a model which has uh, been on special offer from quite a few different places. And, you know, I can never resist the lure of a special offer locomotive. Just had to have it and see what they're really like. And it's a 280 locomotive as well. One of my personal favourite wheel arrangements. So without further ado, and in association with our sponsor, Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories, we're going to be taking a closer look. And I'd love it if you come with me. <laughs> This is today's model. It's the Thompson 01 class locomotive. Came out from Hornby a little while ago and at the moment it's on offer at a huge number of different places that I've found. And I thought it was a great opportunity to take a really good close look at this locomotive to show you guys just what you get. Now the Thompson 01 class was actually quite a latecomer to the LNER stable. It was a Second World War rebuild of some of the 04 class, the Robinson 04, and that is a locomotive that is available from another manufacturer and we have reviewed them in the past. But on the LNER, they were coming to uh, the end of their life, getting a bit worn out. So because there was restrictions during the war on building all new locomotives, they came up with the idea that they would effectively rebuild old Robinson 04 locomotives to create effectively a new heavy freight locomotive. And thus the Thompson 01 class was born. Now these reused the tenders, the wheels, the frames, and the front pony truck from the Robinson 04, but everything else was new using the boilers that had been designed for the B1 class. They also had roomier cabs and a few other designs, including wall shots, outside valve gear, and completely new cylinders. The locomotives weren't converted en masse. Instead, the locomotives were assessed when they came in for works overhaul, and principally it was those that had worn out cylinders and were in need of new boilers that went through into the program. So the running numbers of these were not consecutive, and there was no real rhyme or reason to which ones got converted other than those that were going to need new cylinder blocks anyway. Anyway, there is on the back of the box a potted history of the class, so if you want to learn more, uh, there is a Wikipedia page. I also recommend the LNER Locomotive Encyclopedia, which is a great online resource, telling you a lot of information about not just this class, but every class that uh, the London and North Eastern Railway had. This particular example, I've gone for the BR Early Crest Black, and uh, we've got on the end there the catalogue number R3730, BR Thompson Class 01, number 63806. But the locomotive is also available with a Late Crest BR, and also in its LNER wartime livery too. I've gone for this particular one because I, I tend to have a preference to the earlier BR period, but whatever's your poison, we do have some links in the description box down below to help you find the one that you would really like. And at the moment, at a price hovering around the £89 mark seems to be about average of what I've been able to find these for. They certainly offer great value for money for a 280 tender locomotive. You do get an awful lot of locomotive for your money. Now inside the box, I'll show you this before I put it to one side, you do get the brake gear for under the locomotive and under the tender, and there are a couple of crew ladders as well, which you can only really fit the ladders if you've not got really tight corners on your model railway. So um, most people would probably be, like me, choose not to fit them. The brake gear as well can be a little bit fiddly, but actually for most people, you don't really need to fit it because from most angles, you probably won't see it. 
The weight of this model is incredible. It feels like the boiler, the running plate, is all die cast metal, and it's really nice to see. A lot of people lament the loss of die cast metal locomotives since the days of Hornby 00, but I put it to you, they're still here and better than ever, and Hornby is doing it just well. It's uh, finished in this, what could actually be described as quite a utilitarian black. But black is a colour which, if it makes sense, is quite difficult to get absolutely right in model form. And on this model, Hornby have done very well, as indeed they've done with a lot of the previous Hornby models in this utilitarian black that we've reviewed. It's a slightly satin finish, and that helps a lot because pure matte black in model form can look a little bit odd. So it's nice to see that Hornby have gone for this satin look. Pure gloss as well, I think looks quite bizarre too. And this strikes a really nice balance. What tampo printing there is, is really sharply done. So we've got the BR Cycling Lion logo and it comes out very, very crisply on this tender side. And I'm really impressed with just how sharp that is and all the different colors that are in there. And I suppose with the rest of the model being quite utilitarian, it really does show an attention to detail that they've made such a great effort with the bits that are different that really bring this model to life. On the cab side as well, we've got the number 63806, and that is really sharp and crisp, just as you would expect, but there's no blurring of the edges of these numbers, and it is really nice to see. In terms of other tampo printing on the outside of this model, there's not really anything much else to see other than the works plate there at the front. Now, with my naked eye, I can't see whether this works plate is for the rebuild or whether the locomotive retained its original works plate from when it was an 04, built probably at Gorton Works back in the pre-grouping period. But under close magnification, I'm sure that we'll be able to see that. And I suspect that it's a works plate for the rebuild itself. And that would make a lot of sense. Now the Walshutz valve gear on the side there, this is really where Hornby excel themselves. The coupling rods are fluted as they should be and are really finely done and it's something that I've always seen with the Hornby models that they do particularly well. This is their forte and this model does not disappoint. We don't get any of the slightly chunky oversized look it is faithful to the prototype, but it doesn't mean that we compromise integrity. These models will also run and run and run and need only light lubrication to keep them going. So they are versatile and durable to boot. And that's what I really like to see. The closer you look at this valve gear, the more there is to see. And it really is just exquisite to see the detail with this full metal crosshead and everything. It's a really nice design. And when the locomotive is running, it really does look sweet. As this locomotive crawls along at near scale slow speeds, it just looks the part. The wheels themselves are nicely done with these quite slender spokes. And uh, they faithfully capture the look of those Robinson 04 wheels nicely. The front bogey as well, again, they've captured the look of that older pre-grouping parts that were carried over in these builds really, really well. The front bogey itself, if I turn it over, is on a cam system that is set uh, to self-centre it. And actually, unlike the earlier model of the L1, which suffered a few issues with this front cam system, Hornby really seemed to have got it to work properly with this model. And when I had it run, Running, I saw no sign of the front bogey crabbing or any other issues with derailing or otherwise. The drain cocks on this model come factory fitted because the turning circle of that front bogey doesn't impinge on them in any way. And it's a really nice touch. And actually seeing these, it just shows how much improvement those do give to a locomotive if you are able to fit them. Usually they'd come in the detail pack, but with this, it is a nice touch that Hornby have factory fitted them for you. And there is no compromise to the corners that this locomotive can get round as a result. Looking to the front of the locomotive, this has been captured really well. And this is another area where it looks to differ quite a lot from the Robinson 04 that they were built from. Whereas the Robinson 04 had a fairly flat level running plate, this has one that uh, curves up and then runs at a higher level. 
The Robinson 04 had a splasher that covered the rear three driving wheels and then a separate one that covered the front. On this, the wheels do not protrude through the running plate. This goes entirely above the level of the wheels and this gives this locomotive a very different outlook to the Robinson 04 that it was rebuilt from. The frames themselves weren't actually extended in any way during the build, but it's interesting that when I compare this to the Robinson 04 that's on the market, they come up ever so slightly different lengths, and I'm not sure whether that is a testament to one or the other being slightly under or over scale. It may also be the fact that during the rebuild, the buffer beams did get changed, and that may account for the difference in length. But when I've actually been looking into to these locomotives I can't find a lot of details as to what else changed dimensionally during the rebuilds. Looking to the tender this is a really nice representation of the Robinson era ROD tender and it's an interesting to note that these tenders got around a lot. Not just common to the Robinson 04, the 05s, they also found their way to being used by the Q4s as well. And moreover, they were moved to the Great Western Railway in some of the rod locomotives that they bought, and even found their way to being run with some of the Collet locomotives too. So these were a very versatile tender, and it'll be interesting to see whether Hornby has any future plans for models that make full advantage of them already having tooled up this fine tender. The tender itself is really nicely realised with these outside frames, the springs, the axle box covers, everything is really crisply done. There's no sign of fuzziness in the moulding quality and it is really nicely put together. Even the brake blocks line up with the wheel treads as you would expect them to do. Looking down into the tender, we have pickups from all six wheels. You can also see down there the air holes where the speaker mount is in the tender. And we're going to show you a full DCC fitting guide for this locomotive at the end. There is no bespoke TTS sound decoder for this, but if you do wish to go down the TTS sound route for these, I can well recommend the J36 TTS sound chip. It replicates a two-cylinder prototype with an LNER era whistle, and I think that that would be a reasonably good match for this locomotive. The rear coupling comes in a NEM pocket, so you can swap that out if you so desire. And actually, if you go the three-link coupling route, that NEM pocket where it attaches to the tender is pretty unobtrusive. The tender drawbar, this is an area that Hornby very much do right. And I've long been an advocate that I wish that other locomotive manufacturers would adopt this style or at least something similar. As you can see, the locomotive and tender are well and truly attached together. You can undo them by unscrewing these screws and indeed, as you can see there, there is a second hole that allows you to close couple the tender and locomotive if you have much more generous curves on your model railway. But it means that they can't accidentally come apart and put a strain on that wire and the tender connection. One of the other things that I really like that Hornby have done is they've moved where the connector is and it's much less obtrusive and much less likely to get caught on things. So again, another nice move by Hornby. The rear of the tender is nicely done. We have fully sprung turned metal buffers and separately applied handrails. It can be a little bit difficult to see in, in the light uh, on the camera, but trust me, they are all there and they are exquisitely done. The top of the tender features this coal load. I believe it does come out, but I am struggling to find a way of levering it out. There's no obvious joins, but compared with the other Robinson style tenders which are on the market with other classes of locomotives, it's nice to see that Hornby have chosen to model this only part full of coal, which gives you an alternative look to other locomotives that may be in your fleet. And actually, I prefer this to a tender being modelled with a full heap of coal. It just gives it a little bit more character. And the actual design of that coal heap is really nicely done. Again, another area that model manufacturers are really paying close attention to detail to, and it really does look like a genuine real hump of coal. 
Turning to the inside of the cab, we can see in there that that's where a lot of the rest of the Tempo printing is hiding. It is really nicely done. We have a separate regulator handle, brake handle in there, and it is a really nice package. I'm just looking down, and it does appear as well that the gauge glasses for the boiler are done in plastic, so they look like glass. That is a really nice touch, and it's just amazing how we've come on so far with the detail that is inside these cabs. The tender fall plate comes in the upright position, and again, it's one of my big gripes that it neither suits one nor the other. It, it just doesn't feel right to me. Pushing on that, I can't feel any give in it, and it's an area that... In all honesty, I think I'd rather there not being a tender fall plate than having one in this sort of betwixt and between position of kind of 45 degrees. I know why they've done it, but it would be nice that if it's not posable, maybe put that in the detail bag as something that uh, end consumers can fit themselves. It is a little bit of a detraction to me, but only a minor one at that. The top of the cab roof has this uh, ventilation uh, slide in it, but it seems to be modelled permanently open. I can understand why Hornby have gone this route, and it's one that on some of their other models they've had a little sliding piece that uh, you can pose either open, closed, or somewhere in between. But that must add cost to the making of a model, so I can see why they've gone this route. But to model it open, I suppose that shows it off a bit and gives you a little bit of a window into seeing that fabulous back head detail. But my personal preference would be to have it modelled in the closed position. I don't know, like this it just looks like the actual sliding piece has somehow become detached and lost. The safety valves are turned metal, really nicely done, and then we've got a whistle behind. I can't tell whether that's plastic or turned metal, but certainly it does look perfect. So whether it's one or the other, it has been done in the best possible way. The rest of the boiler, it's a very chunky, large utilitarian boiler. And when you put this locomotive side by side with the Robinson 04 that it's derived from, it looks incredibly different. It's almost hard to believe that this is a rebuild of that much, much earlier locomotive. Such are the difference. These handrails are nicely done and blackened to match. They really don't look out of place. Looking down the funnel, we can see that uh, there is a hole down into the innards of the locomotive, though I can actually see part of the chassis down there. A little dab with matte black paint would fix that, so it's again, it's not really a big detraction. The front face of this locomotive is captured ever so well. Tampo printing, we've got a shed code plate on there, and the running number across the plate in the middle of the smoke box door. All of the detail on the smoke box door is exquisitely done. We have the fittings on there are really, really nicely done and very, very delicate. I'm actually struggling to see that with my naked eye, but it is there and they are really, really nice. The hinges too look very, very fine, almost to the point where you could imagine that that just opens. It doesn't, I've checked but it does look like it could, just like the real thing. The rest of the front face is captured well, with this curving of the running plate and where the frames protrude in the middle. The front buffers, they are nicely done, turned metal, and again, different from the buffers on the tender. These are oval in shape, and we get a factory fitted three link coupling too. It looks really nice, it's very rugged. You could actually use that three link coupling as is out of the box. The front coupling goes into a little NEM socket in the front bogey. This comes by default in the detailing bag. I've chosen to fit it because as a freight locomotive it would be equally at home running forwards as well as backwards, but if you don't want this big coupling on the front it can quite easily be not fitted and actually the locomotive doesn't look like it's missing a coupling with a great big ugly hole if you choose to run it without it. It really is nicely done. Overall this is a great package and at the price that they're available at at the moment I can well recommend this locomotive. It has a smoothness of running that is second to none and I am very very pleased to add this to my collection.
DCC fitting, we recommend the use of a Trainomatic 8 pin decoder if you want to go down the route of DCC fitting this. If you want to go the sound route, I recommend the Hornby J36 TTS sound chip. It's the best approximation for this locomotive in the absence of Hornby making a dedicated 01 TTS chip, and it offers great value for money. Both of these chips are fitted in the same way. If we turn the locomotive over, we're looking at the tender, and just down there, you'll see that there are two crosshead screws hidden away between the first and the second axles. Those need to be carefully undone. And then the tender top pulls away like that. I've already pre-fitted this with the Trainomatic 8-pin decoder, but it's a simple task of pulling out the 8-pin blanking plate Underneath that 8-pin blanking plate, you will see on the circuit board a tiny arrow just there. That is your pin 1. Pin 1 corresponds with the orange wire on the DCC decoder, and that is the same for any decoder. When you line up the pins, make sure that they go into the holes. Don't force it, if it won't go, check that the pins are lined up and then with an even pressure from either side you can push that all the way home. If you're just fitting a regular decoder such as this, it's really easy to just tuck that out of the way into the speaker enclosure and then tuck the wires in too so that when we put the top of the tender back on none of the wires catch. If you wish to fit the TTS sound chip, there's a little bit more work required. You'll need to undo these two screws to lift out the daughter board. Be really careful because the wires underneath, you don't want to snap those. That then gives you access to unscrew and remove the speaker enclosure. The TTS speaker that comes with the sound chip will then be a direct plug fit into here facing down and then it's simply a case of reversing the process to put the enclosure back on then the daughter board and then the decoder itself hide it away somewhere inside the tender top you need to make sure that it doesn't fall foul of where the mounting screws come back through here and here and it may be worth using some insulating tape just to hold the wires and chip out of the way of those but if it's just a plain 8-pin chip, it's easy enough to tuck that all out of the way in there. The Trainomatic 8-pin decoder comes ready heat shielded, so you don't have to worry so much about shorting out. But if you're using a chip such as the Hornby TTS chip, you need some kind of protection just to make sure nothing shorts. For those that are curious, this extra little uh, board up at the front end is just simply where the plug from the locomotive to the tender plugs in. You don't need to bother with that at all. To refit the tender top, you're looking at this clip on the back. That needs to go into that slot there. It hooks down and in, and you'll feel it sit nicely in place. If you turn the tender on its side, you shouldn't see any gap down the side and then it's simply a case of reversing the process and putting each of these screws back into place. Do not over tighten these screws, you will run the risk of stripping the thread and then either making it impossible for you to gain access again inside the tender or indeed you may even find that the tender top does not stay in place at all if the thread is completely stripped out. And there you have it, as easy as that. Onto the programming track, it comes up as a default address number three. We can then program the locomotive in the usual way as per the system that you use and pick whichever running number that you want to identify the locomotive. It's as easy as that. We turn now to the scores. First up is finish. It's a fairly basic finish, but that's exactly the same as the prototype. And what you do see is really nicely realized. 
The black in this satin looks that kind of slightly oily look that a real locomotive would. It's a great palette for some basic weathering and certainly with some uh, smoke and soot powders you could really make an amazing job of this locomotive and make it look like the work stained workhorses that they were. The tampo printing on this is really nicely done. The cycling lion is crisp and sharp. Cab side numbers, pretty good. And everything else, what is there, is done really well. It might be a bit basic and utilitarian, but actually that's part of the charm of the locomotive. And I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10 for finish. Functionality. The locomotive ran well, and it's nice to see that Hornby have sorted out that cam on the front pony truck and got rid of some of the issues that they experienced when this design was first introduced on the L1 model some years ago. It did seem a little bit notchy at first running and required a bit of extra running just to get it to run smoothly at low speeds. I found the best thing to do was to give it a little bit of lubrication out of the box, especially on the valve gear, and it's just something that it felt a little bit rough until it had run in. But there weren't any fundamental problems with the running, so I'm going to give it an 8.9 out of 10. Ease of use, principally the DCC fitting. This is again another really easy fitting from Hornby. Getting the tender top off is as easy as undoing two screws. And once you get inside there, there is plenty of room for any chip that you want to fit. They've also pre-designed it for a sound chip and made that one of the easiest fittings possible. So really, there's nothing much to fault on this. So I'm going to give it a 9.9 .9 out of 10. Aesthetics. I think Hornby have really captured the look of this locomotive. It's a joy to be able to add this to my fleet, and I find myself getting more and more drawn to these 280 consolidation wheelbase locomotives. I really do like it. The tender is realised perfectly, and when I've compared it with other manufacturers' models, they are pretty close to each other, and that suggests to me that they are equally as well realised. The finish itself would be improved by a little bit of weathering, but, you know, that's one of the things I think a lot of modellers like their models to be clean, and others too who go for their own weathering like a clean palette to start from, so I don't think there's any problem with that. So for aesthetics, I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10. Value for money. At the moment, these can be had for a really favourable price. For a 280 freight locomotive, I'm finding on average for around £89. Even at their full RRP, they come in at a really great price for what is a highly detailed model. So I've got no qualms of awarding this 9.5 out of 10 for value for money. That gives us a final score of 46.3 out of 50. And that is a really commendable score, and I am very pleased to be able to add the Thompson 01 to my collection. Can I recommend this model? Yes, certainly I can. So do check out those links we've got down below if you really like the look of this model too. I hope you found that video enjoyable, and don't forget we've got some affiliate links down below that will help you find your own version of these great models if you decide to go down that route, and believe me, you won't be disappointed. And also don't forget that you can check us out on Patreon and help support the channel, helping us to make the videos that you want to see. Leave some comments down below, we'd love to hear from you, see what you think about this locomotive, and also see what other bargains you've seen out there that you might recommend that I take a look at for a forthcoming video. But until next time, you take really good care of yourself. And this is me, Jenny Kirk, saying don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and most importantly, take good care of yourself. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Michael Churchwood, Anthony Hunt, William Wade, Wayne Johns, Offshore Allen, OORail.co.uk, 
Tepek, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian Smith, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Judge Mortis, and Gary Lewis. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.